Hi, I'm Connor Williams from Arnett Auctions, a specialist in contemporary art and prints. And I'm here today, very pleased to be in the studio of Russell Young. Russell, thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. So, Russell, the last time we saw each other was in New York, and you had a show that opened. And I know you've, you've got quite a bit of attention in New York, here in California, where we are just outside of L.A., as well as internationally. And you have some wonderful work in public collections, private collections. And for people who, who don't know you, though, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about how you came to become an artist, because there's a really a wonderful story there. Um, I grew up in Northern England. Um, very brutal. Mm -hmm. Lack of light, <laughs> lack of any culture, right. just football terraces, violence. Um, I went to art college, um, spent probably five or six years at art college. I ended up um, with a, an amazing art, um, an art teacher at the Chester Art College called Jack Straw, okay. who was one of the few geniuses I've ever met in my life and just pushed me and pushed me and pushed me and showed me this way out of all the darkness and the brutality of Northern England. Um, I then went to London. Um, I became an assistant photographer for a guy called Christos Raftopoulos, mm -hmm. who taught me how to light, see my own work, um, be criticized my own work, more importantly, almost than, than, than actually creating it. Right. Um, and then I became a photographer in my own right. Um, I photograph Bjork, Springsteen, George Michael, Space Sleeve, right. directed a hundred music videos. Um, it fell out of love with me and I fell out of love with the music business. Um, I moved to California in 91 and then <clears throat> I tried to fall back in love with you know, the music industry and I, I, I struggled for many years. Um, in about the year 2000, late 2000, early 2000, I was like really searching for something else. I had been painting my own paintings for maybe 10 or 20 years. Um, ever since I was a kid, I'd wanted to be an artist. Okay. So as the jobs got more corporate and less creative, I think that's probably why I fell out of love with the music industry. It just, there just was no creativity anymore. It's all about just selling, you know, one person's viewpoint of it and it was normally the marketing director who normally had everything wrong mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so i had to make a decision and my wife was um seven months pregnant with our eldest son and i went to tuscany i sat i meditated for a month or so and i came back and i was an artist and i rented myself a studio in brooklyn and i really haven't looked back um my first series that relates to my former life was a series called Pig Portraits, which um, is mugshots of right. famous people. Because I took famous pictures of famous people all my life. Right. Suddenly, <clears throat> I'm using these mugshots of Sid Vicious, of Elvis, of Mickey Rourke. Al Pacino. Al Pacino, yeah. And, and, and so I just loved, just loved using these pictures, which were taken by a police clerk, maybe four o'clock in the morning, um, in the case of Mickey Rourke, you know. I think, you know, a whole load of stuff had happened. He's there three or four in the morning. This one picture mm -hmm. was better than any picture I ever took of Mickey. I took a whole load of pictures of him. Right. And he always wanted to look cool and hard and mean. And here he is in this mugshot, just looking so cool and hard and mean. And I wanted it almost as a reaction to my former career, which was always about making people look better than they were. I wanted to make them look rough and dirty. Right. But I have a sort of... I, don't, I can't get it out of me. I have a glamorous aspect to the way I right. um, portray things. Well, my, my favorite from that series is actually the Jane Fonda. Oh, yeah. Which I just think of her rebellious years, and I think of that image of her holding her fist up, and I think was she arrested in Cleveland? I, I yeah, 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 just, uh, just a and, little disturbance. And it's beautiful, and, it, it, and yeah. kind of, it, it speaks to the glamour that I think you were about to you know, talk about. Yeah, the, the glamour and the diamond dust that you've also included in yes. a lot of your work. Yeah, most, most of my work deals with two, two aspects, really, fame and shame. Those, those two, right. and I've always been fascinated by fame, and I've always been fascinated by the darker side. So it was a great way to start, really, you know, on another, on another path, really, another mm -hmm. route. Because um, I was using screen printing, which is a photographic medium, so I'd been looking at the negative and positive for maybe, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. 
And so it was really easy for me to understand texture and light and dark and shadows and negative. Now, you predominantly use screen printing as, as your medium, your, your favorite medium. What is it about screen printing that, that you, you love and seem to enjoy? I, I like the roughness of it. I like um, how immediate it is. Um, pe people ask me sometimes, you know, I've done some live shows where I screen printed and they've asked me, they see me do it in like five minutes or four minutes or however long, you know, yeah. three minutes or what. Yeah. And they say, well, how, how long does that take to do? And I said, well, you know, either four minutes or 40 years, you know, because it's the history and the learning curve behind it. I, I like how raw and immediate it is. I think that's what excites me, um, that you go from, you know, I, I hand paint a background, a color, and then suddenly in one stroke, here is this beautiful image of, of Marilyn or Elvis mm -hmm. or Sid Vicious. It's just right. so vibrant and it's, just, it's still like magic. You know, it's like when you um, develop a photograph before digital photography, you would sit in the dark room and this, this image would appear in the dark that would be red. And it just, it, it has that magic. It, it excites me. So where did you learn to screen print then? I, I learned to screen print at college, you know, okay. we, we went through in a foundation course almost like, you know, all the disciplines. So and, and, and even early on, I really that really excited me. And then when I decided I would give up the music business and just be an artist, um, I did these combine paintings, which were picking up elements from the from from all around me, color swatches. And then I started to screen print these little screen prints to add, add mm -hmm. on. And it was suddenly when I did those, was, I was like, oh, I, this is what I want to do. Right. It ju it, I just I guess I have a love of, of the photographic image. Right. And one of your images, the iconic images you've, you've come back to and have often used is, is Marilyn. Yes. Um, some people will call it Marilyn crying or suicide. Yeah. And you're still working on, on some work. Uh, yeah, I've just had mm, three or four shows in Europe with right. the Marilyn Suicide So shows. what is it about Marilyn? Was it when you were photographing these you know, very famous rock stars? Um, or was it just that image that had stuck in your mind you know, before? No, even then? Marilyn comes from, most of my work comes from being a young kid in Northern England. Now, when most people, maybe who don't even know um, Negro work, they see an image. Um, many of the screen prints, they probably often think of, of Warhol. Um, how has he influenced you? I mean, do you, have you collected of his, his work? Is there something in particular about his work that you've enjoyed? Or maybe you have kind of tried to do something completely different? I, it's, it's, a, it's, it's obviously, you know, whether you take Warhol or Lichtenstein sure. or Rauschenberg, sure. they're all working with the... Um, these pop images. Pop images and the photographic image. Okay. I love Warhol's color sense. I think it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's almost bar none in any, in any, you know, I almost would go back to, you know, the Renaissance or Rembrandt right. or whatever, and his sense of color, putting colors next to each other to make an image work, and the ability to put four or five colors into one image that would never, ever go in anybody else's paintings. Right. It just sings and it's alive. So I get a lot from his colors. So that's I, something I, you've tried to <clears throat> apply? Oh, I've always loved color yeah. because of the absence of light and color growing up. I mean, yeah, I've always been drawn to, in a sense, magnificent colors. Right. Uh, my studio, as you can see, is full, full of color, full of energy, full of light. So just to make a, a slight segue from, from that... Um, I guess the influence of the darker um, England from which you came. We have a quite colorful work behind us. Um, and, you know, you're now living outside of L.A. and it's, it's actually gorgeous here today. Yep. Tell us about how, how the environment, and I know you, you surf as well. Um, tell us about how the environment, your enjoyment of the outdoors, the light here, here in California, how that affects maybe, you know, this work here or you've come to kind of realize <coughs> some different work. Well, th this series is called Dreamland, and the first four paintings from this series are on show at the Bank Rubber Gallery in London, mm -hmm. actually now. Um, they are actually about a dark subject. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm completely wrong. <laughs> so so <laughs> they, they, they came out of um, me being very, very sick. 
Okay. Um, I was in a coma. Right. I almost died. I had the H1N1 virus. I hit rock bottom. There was less than a 1% chance of me living. Mm -hmm. For some reason, a brilliant doctor, a whole load of stuff. I was in a coma for eight days. Wow. I lived. But I had to learn to... I couldn't walk. I had oxygen when I came home. I couldn't breathe. I'd forgotten how to read and write. And all I could do was take my big box of colors and just do the, I, I had hardly any strength to even make a mark. Mm -hmm. So I just started to do all these great colors and I just got immersed in these colors. Now, out of that place of color, I went to a very, very dark place. Like, why did I survive? I heard all these other people who had been as sick as I was, all, all dead, dead. You know, mm -hmm. you know everybody got, you know. So it, you go to this horrible, horrible place. So these were my way to in a sense, recover. And it was only three years ago. I couldn't, you know, mm -hmm. I really literally couldn't breathe or walk. Right. Um, so I, the colors might look wonderful and magnificent, but these came out of two or three other series I've done since I was sick. One called Helter Skelter, um, one called The Fight of El Paso de Mar, which are mm -hmm. very big, brutal, masculine paintings. Right. <clears throat> um, these are big paintings. They have a delicacy and light, which are pigments from Italy and California colors are almost reminiscent, you know, of the, the 50s or the 60s. Right, I think it's Sam Francis that was... <clears throat> yeah, Sam Francis, right. he said before. But the thought and the idea of behind these are every time I've come in the last three or four years since I've been sick to a fork in the road, I deliberately take the hardest route. Mm. And then what I did was you find yourself in a harder and harder place. And I found myself in a place where um, you cannot, you almost feel like you can't get out of it. So I started to feed on the idea of not the oh wow moment that almost every other artist, in the, you know, people go, oh yeah, the, the inspiration, the moment I was driving down here, or I saw that, or this person said this to me, and that's how this all came about. You know, the inner sense of creative spark. I was like, right. hang on, I feel very desperate and lonely. Let me feed on the idea of being desperately and lonely and wanting to burn on my work, hating everything I've ever done, you know, which every artist I think goes through. Right. And then they, you know, they get over that block and they come into this, right. this wonderful land. Well, I decided to feed on this darker idea of what happens before the creative, um, you right. know, the oh wow moment. So how I can describe it is it's like, you know, I, like, I sit in my bedroom at night and there's a light on the tree outside and this moth comes and flies into it, right? Well, he comes back again and even though he burns himself, he goes back out again and he comes in and he burns himself again right. just to see if the outcome will be any different. Mm -hmm. um, and it isn't. Um, so that's, that really was the birth of the idea. And I, I really like working on a thought. These are called Dreamland. These are titled Bikini Atoll. <clears throat> um, they're, they're, they're titled so after the nuclear, the atom even bomb. Even in the title, there's something... Yeah. And the atom bombs and everything relate back to my childhood, where the um, BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, was telling all of us to hide under our desks. Mm -hmm. And we were going through drills as kids to what would happen when the atom bomb comes. Hide under a, uh, hide under a bloody desk. I mean, really, that's going to help, you know. Um, <laughs> so what I did... I, I, I refused. I just would stand up. I, I actually refused. I, I realized as a kid, a young, young kid, that it was an absolute ridiculous idea. And that was almost my, I guess, my mm. first punk moment as a kid. You know, I just was like, no, I, I just yeah. disagree with everything that you, you're trying to teach me, that you're right. trying to install me. Um, the first things I did in the mug shots was a Sid and Elvis. And my wife came home and she walked into the living room and went, oh, oh my God, who, whose work is this? Who do you? I said, I did this. I did it for us. I did it because I want to do it. Mm -hmm. So everything I've done is because I want to do it. I've gone back to the Marilyn, um, in a sense, crying image and called it suicide, which is in a sense uh, sort of, you know, echoes her, her life. Not only just the one image, it's not just about the one image. Sure, so, sure. so in a sense, you know, I, I, I just, I don't, you know, I've been lucky. Right. And there's nobody in this whole world that's successful that hasn't got there through luck mm -hmm. and just hard work and hard work and hard work and hard work. I mean, that's all it is. It's putting the hours in right. and just working hard. So are you, for a lot of people who obviously don't have an artist studio, um, <laughs> myself included, um, 
and maybe aren't uh, accustomed to actually visiting the artist studio, how often are you in this studio? Do you take time off because you're thinking of an idea or are you constantly working out ideas? What is, what is that like day in day out for you? Okay, the, the, the process. It's the process of working yeah. as in the process of, um, in a sense, creating. The, I have a live webcam okay. in the studio. RussellYoung.com, live webcam, 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. My friends are stunned at how, how infrequently I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have other places to work on the property. I'm in New York working. Um, I'm going to Italy to work this summer for a month, maybe two sure. months on some series. But I come here and I sit and I think and I sometimes fall asleep in this seat, you know, for eight hours sometimes. And I come, <laughs> I wake up, but it, it's, it's good. It's a creative process. Right. Um, normally when I, you know, I've, I know this place is an honest place because the things that upset, I can cry in this room. Mm -hmm. um, the things that upset me in life, when I think about them and I go deeply into them, I, this room is so honest that I'm able to cry in here. Um, I come up with most of my ideas... Driving the kids to school, for instance, you know, a few weeks ago, I pulled off the freeway. And I'm like, what's dad doing? You know, who, who's in trouble now? Um, I pull off and I start writing. And they're like, what are you doing? Shh, kids, kids. And I just came up with um, what may be the next series. But I just had to pull off. So you never know where the th a thought process sure. leads. But this is a great place to, to right. come and, you know, I mean, you can see I've got all the paints. I've got every linen. Anytime I come up with any idea, I can come and experiment with it right. down here. It's not any different, I suppose, from uh, many artists where you've seen if it's Picasso who's, who's put something on a napkin, right? right? When they've been out to dinner and they <coughs> yeah. come back and they explore that idea more thoroughly. You have those moments of creativity. Oh, yeah, when just, I come back from dinner, quite often my whole hand's like, you know, I, I write <laughs> right. on my hand because then right. you, don't, you don't forget it, you know. Right, there you have it. So tell us a little bit about your new work. Um, I know we just had a, had a quick look and... and um, but it, it, it too is abstract, but you're really playing with the process even a bit more and even how, how time also affects. Yeah. Um, one series that is ongoing, um, which I'm having a show of next, in the, next in, in the spring to summer of 2014 with nailing down all the details, is called The Fight of El Paso de Mar. Mm -hmm. um, these are large 9 feet, 10 feet by 10 feet paintings oh. that are printed... With, with a background screen print on the floor, quite a small screen. And I'm working for maybe two or three hours just pushing enamel through this screen. And the enamel's getting on the back of the screen. Then I'm using a, a powder, an oxide powder. And there's, there's a clip out there that, that, um, that shows me working with this powder. And I'm using it almost like an, a, a, a conventional artist would use a brush stroke. Okay. I mean, I'm very deliberately throwing this powder into the air, and because it's so heavy, it sinks so fast because it's heavier than mm -hmm. air. And it, sure. and it just, it almost, I mean, when I see it, it's almost like a mushroom cloud in reverse occurs. And all this dust is floating in the air. That settles on the painting. I'm pinning these on the wall. Where it gets heavy in the enamel, it drips, and it sort of just slides down the painting. Then I'm, when I'm going surfing, um, I'm getting seawater and I'm putting seawater on these paintings mm -hmm. and then I'm leaving them out in California, which is not the best place to leave it out for rain, but sure. I'm leaving them out and heavy rainstorms comes and then they patina the paintings in another direction. So I'm using linen, oil, enamel. I'm using, in a sense, iron, seawater and rain to create these paintings. Right. They're, it's, it's all about the process. Mm -hmm. um, but they're very big dark, masculine. Um, in a sense, from being sick, being so frail, I've really embraced um, the masculinity of painting and being a male painter. Right. And do they vary in size? Are some of them smaller, some of them yeah, larger? Yeah, I've, 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 I'm experimenting on some smaller size, which I have in the studio outside. I have an outdoor studio where I create these pieces mm -hmm. and I can leave them up for months to, to weather an age right. and to be beaten by the, you know, the sun and the rain and whatever right. else and comes. And where will these be exhibited? Will they be internationally or just... Yeah, oh no, very much so. Okay. Um, they'll probably be... We have a... Um, we'll probably have a smaller exhibition 
at the Bank Robber Gallery in London in the spring. Mm-hmm. Um, that's in Mayfair. And that will have a performance piece, which is me working on one of these processes. Now, have you also been involved in a foundation for, for kids? Yeah. Well, yeah, can there's you a charity. Can, can you tell us a little bit about amazing charity this? called The Art of Elysium. Mm-hmm. Um, and the founder, Jennifer Howell, I've worked with them for, well, the very first show I ever did was um, to partially benefit them. Okay. Um, they showed the first pig portrait show. Um, you know, I do workshops with them. We go in and they, they work with 25,000 children every single year. And they, we, we, we work with terminally ill and long-term patients, okay. most, mostly in L.A. Well, one, one last question I wanted to ask, and kind of getting back to my roots as, as a, a print specialist, if there was one print that you could have, you don't have currently, you know, you could acquire it, be in your collection. Which which print would would that be? Oh, oh my goodness, that's a terrible. No, thing. there are. Oh, Christ. <clears throat> um, you can name a few if, if, well, you, if, yeah, you, I if mean, you wish. It, yeah. Okay. So of my own work. No, 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 no. Other artists. No, no, but my own work oh, okay. at the moment, my biggest dilemma at the moment, that really struck a chord with me. I, I sort of knew you were talking about other people's work, but my mind just went to my own work. There are four pieces up at the Bank Rubber Gallery now that mm-hmm. are for sale, mm-hmm. which are the first four from this series. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to buy, I want to go, I actually want to send somebody in and buy them myself and not let the gallery <laughs> owner know I'm buying. I mean, they are the hardest, hardest thing I have ever, ever had to part with Mm -hmm. and I don't want to part with them you know I mean and you know and as I'm working on these it's like it really has resonates um you know really resonates in me I I I would I would love to own um one of those large Richard Serra um just I, 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 the, I, the paint I'm, stick. Yeah, just those huge things on paper. I right. mean, if we're talking about something on paper, I, I don't right. think there's that any. He, that he printed with, I think most of them printed with Gemini here. Yeah, obviously here, yeah. here in LA. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're just they're just stunning. They're just so again, it's the the physicality, that kind of roughness on yeah. paper on yeah. that that really really appeals to you. Yeah, yeah. That's um. Yeah, I don't re- often. I mean, I obviously love his sculptures. I don't often think of. Him in those print terms, but yeah, that's right. they're beautiful. Yeah, they and I love my Warhols. I mean, those right. the Warhol electric. I'd love a whole suite of the Warhol electric right. chair series. Well, Russell, um, unless you want to ask me a question, no, kidding. When we go, uh, when, <laughs> when we go out for dinner and drinking again. I want to thank you for for allowing us to to come into your studio. I know you've said you haven't. Um, you know, not many people do have the opportunity to come here aside from maybe viewing your your yeah. webcam. But it's been a, a really wonderful opportunity and we're excited to see your new work. Great. And uh, please well, thank you thank you for coming all the way out you, here. If you invite us back I will yeah, I will California's say, a hard place to come to from New York. Okay? That's true, that's true. Well again Russell, thank you so thank much. Thank you. And we'll see you soon. All right, thank you.